Hey, it's Katie Crysdale here from Lakeview Aquatic Consultants. I'm here this morning with Raylene. Raylene posted an amazing post on an aquatic professional Facebook group a few days ago. I got to texting with her and I thought, wouldn't this be a great conversation to actually talk more about the post and what led to her writing it? So Raylene, do you want to introduce yourself and give a little bit of background of your experience working in aquatics? Yeah, so my name is Raylene Pitek. I've been in aquatics for 20 years now. Um, so been kind of uh, different facilities from large recreation facilities to outdoor lakes, um, you know, with uh, water park and waterfront and all those fun things. So otherwise, i um, been kind of everywhere, worked my way up since I was 16, from junior lifeguards to senior lifeguards, head guards, programming, and then also aquatic supervisor and just kind of everywhere. Continued on doing my certifications and getting my my trainers and a lot of the courses and stuff and just uh, working through those items. So one of the things I love about Raylene, we've been connected for a number of years now, is she's not shy about upsetting the apple cart and starting a good conversation, whether that's in person at a meeting or whether that's on Facebook. And so we both live in Alberta and we do have an Alberta Aquatic Professional Facebook group that is a really great resource for people who might be new to management or new to making that transition from maybe senior lifeguard or head guard into a supervisory role. So I want to go ahead and pull up on the screen uh, the post. So Raylene put up this post a few days ago and I was sitting on my couch reading it and I thought, wow, like this is somebody who is super passionate about leadership. And so can you talk a little bit, Raylene, about what prompted you to post this? Like what had you been reading or thinking or what kind of prompted you to post this? Yeah, I think just kind of working in these leadership roles. And I think often, you know, I tend to do a lot of reading when it comes to those leadership books and even just YouTube pages and stuff like that. Um, being able to recognize kind of, I feel like there's that gap in aquatics for us, um, just because a lot of times, even like myself, going from somebody who is like a, you know, a lifeguard at 16. And then, you know, all of a sudden we get these years of experience behind us. So we automatically think that they're ready to take on the next role, but um, the next role as in like, okay, well, they know how to clean everything and they know how to, you know, do all the processes and the procedures, but then we're moving them into these positions of actual like leadership where they're actually supposed to be mentoring the people that they were before. And what experience and training are we giving them? And even as we move up, you know, you see a lot of, um, you know, even in those coordinator roles, or even when we move up to supervisor positions, those things often were put in them. And then there's none of that additional training on how to actually mentor the people that you used to be. So we always talk about, you know, doing their um, shadow guarding and doing their shadow teaching and doing those things. But at the same time, like, how do we teach our instructors to give feedback? How do we teach, you know, our, our lifeguards and our head guards and all of these roles that they keep transitioning into how to provide feedback, how to have difficult conversations, how to mentor at a distance and even indirectly versus, you know, just always there. And I find that it's just kind of a gap that we have. I see a lot of posts just about, um, one that always gets me is the the youth today not being motivated and not being excited to work and not being all of these things. And, you know, they're lazy, they're on their phones. Um, when it's actually like that self-reflection piece that we're missing is, you know, are they excited to come to work? Like, are they excited to work for you? Like, what are you doing to teach them about their jobs? What are you doing to make them engaged? What are you not just like nailing down the hammer of, you know, get off your phones, do these things, but how are we actually engaging them, mentoring them, growing them and taking those opportunities to do better by them? Because I can honestly say, I, I don't think that I've had many actual lazy youth. I find it's just the lack of leadership in our spaces, but it's not just their fault. It's also that they don't know how. For sure. And I think there's so much to unpack there. I agree with you on so many things that it's not just the quote, lazy youth, as you said, there's a lot of gaps in the way people are interacting with their team. Yes, certainly I could be, you know, my late 30s, and they could be in their late teens. And I don't necessarily immediately know how to respond 
to that demographic without going to learn about what motivates them or what they as a person are passionate about or what their personality is in my workplace. I think a lot of people are doing exactly what you say, like, oh, I, I just can't. They're difficult to work with. There's not that self-reflection to figure out what to do. So I guess a question for me is how do you build that into your day-to-day -day work? Because you're in a management position. How do you make sure that you're learning about those things before they become an issue? Like, do you have a routine for reading or like certain websites that you check? Yeah, I'm massive just on reading typical leadership books. I have a few people that I'm kind of a fan of. I always kind of lean towards that Simon Sinek. I find he's very real and honest and talks about the actual issues and that, you know, we're not actually being involved in them. And sometimes, you know, even in my post, I wrote in there that, you know, it's not just about bringing donuts every so often, right? So, and one, um, you know, thing that I had always heard was, um, you know, there was a coach who couldn't get there's this one kid who could never skate and he'd never try and he was never energetic. And he was just a, you know, a little guy, but at the same time, all the other coaches couldn't get him to do anything. And they just kind of wrote him off. And then all of a sudden one day he came in and he was skating hard and he was pushing and he was doing all this stuff. And they asked the coach, like, you know, how did you get him to work for you? And he said, I learned his dog's name. Mm -hmm. And so that idea of building connection with they're still people, right? Like they're still, um, we teach so often in life-saving instructor and even, you know, in WSI when we were there and um, all the different learning styles and the learning techniques and how everyone learns differently. But then for some reason, I find as we get older, we connect on that less. And, you know, it's the same with us as adults, the way that we receive things and, and do things is different from each one of us. So I find that really getting to know each one of your employees as a person um, will help you connect with them a lot easier, make those difficult conversations easier as well, but also asking them what they need. So often we tell them what they need versus asking them what they need, and we may not be connecting with them. 100%. Well, and it's so interesting to the donut example to me, because in my opinion, so much of that has fallen out of favor. Like when I have taken donuts to visit with a client, let's say those were quote standard or typical things we all used to see 15, 20 years ago. And now nobody do, does that anymore, which is not a good thing or a bad thing. Like we go through these cycles of what people need or what people get in the habit of doing, but it's so case specific to your point, right? It Donuts does not solve fundamental problems at a pool that is short staffed or the staff are under trained. Now in a certain situation where it's maybe a hot day and it's, you know, a long day in the summer, some popsicles or some, you know, ice drinks can go a long way in the moment, but it's not going to fix the fundamental issues of not not knowing your staff's name or not knowing that they're stressed for personal reasons. And I think you're absolutely right that people don't seem to be willing to invest the energy as they get older into doing what is basically not a scalable task, right? It would be easy to say, I know all of my team, I know all my staff broadly, but if you don't know them individually, it's not going to work for each person. But I think a lot of managers are so burnt out from other tasks, they, they, convince themselves that they're doing enough when they're not doing enough at all. Yeah, it's tough. It's a hard space to be in because we have, you know, such a large amount of people for such a small amount of management teams. Like, you know, even going through my um, learnings throughout all of this and the the progression through different positions, you know, you see other departments that it's like one manager for three or four people, and then you hit aquatics and it's like, Hey, so you have one person towards 25. Right. And then we always have, you know, we have the least amount of full-time positions. So there's always those challenges because a lot of them are casuals. Um, so you have to get to know them more. You have to get to know these things. Um, and then finding the time, like I can absolutely acknowledge that side of things, but you're, your work output is going to increase the better the relationships are. Your turnover is going to decrease the better your training is, the better your relationships are, the more teamwork you build, right? Like everything's just going to kind of increase and support itself versus you have, it's a lot of work at the beginning, but in the long run, you're going to benefit that much more. Like turnover is the highest cost in any business or organization from having to post to interview, to do all of these things 
it's a lot of time. Like I think in aquatics, we're like, okay, it's recruitment time. We're hiring 13, right? Like we all know it's a big thing. So um, building those relationships. So you have longer standing employees. Um, and I think that's something that we're kind of navigating through right now is I see a lot of, you know, shortage of aquatics. And this is probably a hot topic because I have a very different perspective. <laughs> on it. Um, but I, I honestly, I, I don't, I don't know if COVID is the excuse for shortage in aquatics anymore versus what does our management and leadership look like in aquatics? How are we promoting aquatics? What are we doing to do those things? And we're kind of falling short on that because I've been to a lot of these facilities and I'm like, as an adult, I wouldn't want to work in these facilities. Why do the youth? What is exciting for them about it? What is, you know, like engaging them? How are we actually like incorporating these things? And even when it comes to our training, how are we making it fun and engaging and like actually exciting for them? They're still youth. Well, and I think we should hit on whatever your opinion is in just a moment, but I'm with you that it's it's been too long that people have relied on underpaid uh, younger staff as though that allows them to do less or to try less or to even incentivize less. And I think that's been a fallback for a lot of organizations. And we could have a whole conversation to your point about ratios where aquatics exactly is expected to have one, maybe two supervisors for a team of 25 to 75 people. And that span of control is not effective. And it's often the large just team or department within an organization, and yet it has the least funding, the least professional development budget, the least oversight, the least support from HR and other business units. Like it's just, it's the deck is stacked against you before you even start. But one of the things I really did love about your original post was the point that you made that uh, your staff's success is a direct reflection on your leadership. And so it's not to beat people over the head. Aquatics, a lot of managers are already doing way more than we could expect them to with a limited budget and limited time and competing demands. But I do think there's a tendency to say, yeah, not my problem. That's just how they are. Or, you know, taking no accountability for either um, uh, performance management issues or behavioral issues when it comes to customer service or working with the public. They just think it's the person. They don't realize it's a lack of training or their own uh, lack of oversight, right? They don't actually see their role in that problem. Yeah, I think acknowledging when you're hitting those items that it's like, okay, well, you know, they're, they're not very successful, or I have to have a dis like a conversation, especially before you get to those spaces, asking yourself if you've done everything that you can to set them up for success, right? And whether that's, you know, sometimes we got to draw pictures in color, but at the same time, like, that is still part of that learning process, right? Have we given them, even in our orientations, our orientations should be really encompassing all of those different things, whether we have, you know, a checklist, we're physically doing it, and we're actually like engaging with them verbally, so that they're hitting all of those places to set them up for the best success. And even then, coming out of an orientation, you know, they're getting loads of information, expect, expect them to be successful in 30% of it, the next has to be reminders and coaching, right? So often, we like throw them into these spaces. And I, um, back to that statement of, you know, like they are a direct reflection of you. And so often, you know, I watch, I had left for a little bit aquatics for six months because I realized I enjoyed it and, um, you know, worked for a company and, and was working with, you know, management and when they were going to do the performance reviews, like coaching them through those things. And they were like, oh, well, there are two out of five, there are one out of five, there are two out of five. And I'm like, you also has to take this as a report card for yourself, right? So why are they that? Why are they sitting in those spaces? Like, what have you not done? And handing them these reviews that are just going to crush them when it should actually be, you know, you saying, sitting in that review being like, this is work we have to do, right? Like, maybe I have fallen short on this too, and being able to have those conversations. And I think, that reflection builds connection and also being able to acknowledge that you can do better by them will also help that relationship open up to be better. And so that they'll work harder for you, but we're not building connection anymore. So they don't, there's no trust in our spaces. 
Well, and I love what you said about the checklist because I've worked with a number of organizations in the last year that have been really focused on their onboarding checklist for aquatics, which is great. They're getting that one-on-one, you know, the junior guard shadows the senior guard for several days shows uh, they see all the tasks that they're supposed to do and in theory at the end of their shadow shifts they have an understanding of what they need to be doing but that's not followed up with any sort of reference manuals that the guard can then go back to and read on their own time am I actually doing this correctly and these are often people who are very willing to confirm did I understand this task correctly And the feedback in mentioning that to these organizations was, well, we don't have the time to write these manuals, right? We don't have the time to write these procedures. But then in another breath, they're saying, well, we don't really have the time to keep onboarding all of these people because the shadowing is so intensive for the guards on those shifts. They're basically not able to do their regular duties because they're you know, their time is taken up mentoring a new guard. So they're not seeing this vicious circle where, you know, the junior guards are not performing the way you'd like because they had onboarding, but they didn't have anything to back that up. And then you're complaining about having to onboard so frequently because there's no staff retention because they're getting those um, c- those probationary reviews at 90 days that are not as successful as they would like. And so they're saying, well, you know, they're throwing in the towel because, you know, what they did everything they were asked to do, but it wasn't necessarily enough to support their success. Yeah. One of those things, if I could challenge like everyone to, to go and do, you know, we have monkey survey, which is just a super easy, free platform, throw out five very honest, basic generic questions to your team, let them respond honestly. And I think getting rid of that fear of repercussion is super, super important because you're not hearing honest feedback and being able to take everything that they've written in that survey. And a lot of times we'll instantly go to feedback that's negative and defend it right to the context of ourselves versus saying at some point in that feedback, it's real. It may not be real for me, or I may not feel that same way, but obviously somebody else has felt that way to put it in writing. So how do we combat these things? And a lot of fi- lot of times I'm finding in aquatics, it's just a lack of trust and a lack of transparency. We like to keep things hidden. We don't want to tell them. We don't want to share. We don't have rules or boundaries for like respect or, you know, um, especially from those management and leadership positions down, right? We, we tell them that they're kids, but yet we want them to be responsible for saving a life. So how are we actually translating these items that we're doing and growing and building them? It's just a huge issue I find across aquatics right now. (laughs) And to your point, I think it's that analysis paralysis, like people are waiting for an annual review or a set timeline to be able to do those surveys. And I love what you're saying that, you know, on your next all staff email or on your when to work message board or wherever, just popping up a couple of questions or a link to survey monkey or whatever and saying hey fill this in and maybe not everyone fills it in but if you get the couple of people they may quote unquote have an axe to grind but on very legitimate things that you need to have a spotlight aimed at to assess right don't wait for an annual review once a year or don't wait for your shutdown to get caught up just putting it out there with two or three questions to assess where things are at before it reaches critical mass The biggest thing on that is repeating it every three months, send out the exact same questions and see what your response is. And if it's growing and getting better, right. And being honest and doing that every three to six months, just so that you're actually getting that temperature gauge if things are improving, right. So have we combated that issue and are we getting better in these comments and feedback? Cause you know, and, and being honest with your staff that, you know, you're going to, you're going to make mistakes. Like even in matters management and leadership roles, like I'm I'm gonna make mistake. The problem is is that we're not seeing them as human and giving them the opportunity to make mistakes and grow and learn. And so they don't do the same for us in return. So unfortunately, that's where a lot of those spaces come from as we expect them to be perfect without providing them opportunities to learn and grow. So Well, and I think too, a lot of managers or supervisors are unwilling to consider the feedback from their team. They don't realize that they have a natural bias against the quote unquote, maybe the young people or the junior guards. They think, well, you know, they're only here two days a week. They don't know everything that's going on at this facility. Their feedback is not valid. 
they would almost prioritize a customer's feedback to their face before they would prioritize uh, comments in a survey from their team who actually knows more of what's going on than maybe you give them credit for. So I think being able to do that 360, like you've been saying, is being open to feedback, whether it's from the bottom up or the top down, that it's not just, uh, you know, there's a lot of room for improvement. And straight to your comment, Katie, that you said, like, you know, we'll prioritize what a customer or somebody has said is also showing a lack of trust in our own staff, right? So um, it's going both ways. Like they don't trust us. We don't trust them. How do we bridge that gap? And that always comes back to that leadership team is, you know, have you trained them? How do you trust what they're saying or doing? Have you given them those opportunities in, you know, in services and trainings to grow and develop those skills? And for some reason we give them, you know, their NL course. um, And then we expect them to come out and be able to combat all of these things, but incorporating in your in-services, you know, dealing with difficult conversations and actually like doing scenarios with those more often that it's like, now let's talk about how the approach went. Let's talk about our body language. Let's talk about, you know, the things that we said and words that are kind of cueing for people and how we can actually work this stuff. But that also means that us as aquatics people have to um, take that on and, and educate ourselves on those things too. So I find there's, we're hitting that wall as we go up even not just aquatic specifically, but I find in lots of management positions and stuff like that, where, you know, as again, back to Simon Sinek, he says, you know, we send you to a course, a leadership course, and you walk out and you're now a leader. And it's like, no, it's, it's every day and it's work and it's reflection, so much self-reflection and also being able to acknowledge when you make a mistake and work towards doing better in that. It's amazing. As you were saying that, I was having this kind of brain explosion where I was thinking, okay, so in the National Lifeguard, when we do PR scenarios and we have, you know, the sort of the the charades or just the the mock scenarios where the lifeguard candidate is practicing how they would interact with the customer who's complaining about something um, in the facility, why are we not also extending that further into uh, difficult conversations that we might have with our colleagues as lifeguards? You know, hey, you rotated late and I was really hungry and that left me out on deck without the ability to get a snack. Or, hey, you didn't let me know about the non-swimmer in my zone. And so I had to go up to that parent a second time and they were embarrassed after they'd already received education 10 minutes ago. Wouldn't it be really valuable to start those difficult conversations that I know a lot of lifeguards figure out once they get to work, but that is really the starting point for a lot of people in even having those conversations with their managers. Like if they can't have it with their colleague, they can't have it with their boss. Yeah, absolutely. And respect that team building, right? Like we really got to build that team and, you know, actually have them be proud of their space And that encouragement, again, like I find that lots of times go back to the donut thing. You know, we have it on our checklist that on the second of each month, we're going to go and drop off donuts just to like show that we've done something right. But, you know, like that donut thing can be the engagement to a conversation, right? Stay there for the next half an hour. Whoever comes and gets a donut, have a conversation with them. It's not just a drop and go, but it also comes back to us building those spaces and um, actually you know, the respect for their team. What does that team building look like? And the more your, I've always found the, the better your skills become in, you know, aquatics, when it comes down to your national lifeguard skills, when it comes down to your standard first aid, when it comes down to these things, um, the more confidence they build in each other, they start becoming each other's cheerleaders. They start becoming closer. And, you know, I always, go back to that like firefighter reference that, you know, they all push each other and they all grow together and they all work through these things. And I find as those things improve, it's the exact same thing in aquatics. You can watch an amazing team develop within these quote unquote kids that we call them, but they're actually like amazing young adults that have so much emphasis in them that they want to grow and learn. We are the ones who are capping them. I had somebody tell me the other day that um, some of the candidates they couldn't figure out how to put on the headpieces properly. So they wanted to modify it. And I was like, well, no, you just have to teach them. They're like, no, they can't do it. And I'm like, but that's you telling them that they can't. 
It's not you figuring out different ways to teach them so they can be successful. So I often find that it's people that are in our roles and in those leadership roles that are actually capping them. It's not them themselves. So we need to stop telling them what they can't do and push them to do what they can. They can all do it. We need to stop putting that cap on them. They're wonderful. They're amazing. They're courageous and exciting and they're fun. Like, so we need to like continue growing that because they are, they could be strong leaders in our organizations, but we are stopping them. Well, and I think it it's not just an obvious stopping. Like in that case, it does sound like it was obvious that they sh- the instructor should be coming up with another way to teach them. But I know for me, where I've been the most struck is learning from somebody whose brain is completely different from mine, and they identify the problem completely differently in a way that I don't initially understand. But I'm at least open to learning how their brain works and to their thought process and to the outcome, which achieves what we need to get done. But initially, it causes some confusion because our brains are also different. Our personalities are different. Our learning and teaching styles are so different. And I think a lot of older people, whatever you want to define as older, but like within aquatics, the experience that they've been guarding, let's say for five or 10 years, they have gotten so set in their preferences for equipment or rotations or zones that they're just unwilling to consider anything different. And that's under the guise of, well, different is dangerous because it's not the standard. And that's not the case at all. It's being able to say, hey, what value can I get from this younger person who has a totally different way of using the head packs on the spine board? And then what can I incorporate either in our staff training or in my teaching or maybe even in updating our policy? Yeah, I think that's the one thing I've loved about being around different facilities and stuff is also, um, you know, lots of times when I go to a facility and they they have an issue, I can reflect on other facilities and be like, oh, well, you know, I seen this great idea. It might work for you guys really well here, right? So taking all of those great things that you've actually seen or learned from and actually incorporating them in our spaces, um, but also reflecting on the things that didn't work so well. And it's not to say it's bad. It may work in one space, but getting rid of that um, daunting statement of this is how we've always done it, right? So it doesn't mean that it's right. It doesn't mean that it's okay. It doesn't mean that it's bad either. It's just we we can learn and grow from these things and even make things better. So what does that look like in our spaces and how are we doing that? So Well, and to that point, thinking about so many other industries, whether you think about cars or, you know, cell phones, they've changed so much in 20 years. If we talked about this is the way we did it with a cell phone in the early 2000s, when we all had, you know, flip phones worth keypads where you had to tap one key three times to get a certain letter for a text message, you were charged per text message, like things have changed dramatically. And yet sometimes in aquatics, we, we have innovation in some areas, maybe in the way we teach lessons, but there's a lot of um, stagnation in the way we do things, maybe like spinal boarding or lifeguarding. And there's not the willingness to say, hey, we, we may not have the best ideas anymore. And so to your point about whether it's facility sharing or going to professional development sessions like conferences or additional courses, or even just spending a day with a colleague that you like at another facility and seeing how they run their in-service or how they run their shifts, like what duties are the guards doing during the day that can really expand your own, uh, your own skills in ways you hadn't considered. So we don't have a ton of time left, but why don't we chat a little bit about, you were saying uh, you have a different perspective on the quote unquote lifeguard shortage. So I'm curious to know what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I, I do think obviously COVID did have an impact on our space. Like our space was hit immensely being in, you know, um, you know, a management role in that position. um, It was exhausting, right? Like having to lay your staff off and bring them back and, you know, emotionally as well. Like that was, that was quite tough on a lot of people. So um, I absolutely have empathy on that side of things. I think that we are um, going past that, but I do think that currently we, we are struggling with our um, leadership in our spaces. Um, I find a lot of, uh, cutting corners and I find a lot of, you know, like not running courses to, to like standards. I find a lot of 
cutting time and those things where we could actually be using that little bit of extra time to be making them better. And even in our spaces, you know, we're, we're not fun and engaging. We're not um, actually growing them. And I find we've put a lot of rules in place that are telling them that they can't do things versus they can. What does our growth from position to position look like? Um, I've heard lots of spaces are the moment you turn 18, you're now a senior lifeguard, right? So um, those types of things being put in place versus actually making sure that they're competent and confident and, you know, you've given them the opportunities to grow and learn and train them and at like a nice pace, we don't have to wait and then set them up for failure. And I think that that's what we're doing lots is, you know, I've seen lots of spaces that I'm like, I wouldn't want to work here. Why, why would they, right? Like, and even understanding our role is we are also working with youth. What is our role in setting them up for, you know, understanding employment? And we're supposed to be giving, teaching them work ethic, which a lot of times with youth means us working with them and actually setting them up in teams and getting them doing those things. And for some reason, we're in this space of, um, you know, even in their NLs, uh, we're not pushing them to be better than the baseline standard and understanding those certifications um, is that, you know, their NL is the baseline to stand on a pool deck. We should be growing them so that by the time they come to their next research, they're confident that they can pass it. It's easy. Right. So, and especially like two or three after that, where you watch people going into research and they're scared. Right. So that just to me shows that we're actually not doing our jobs, building a space that they're, having fun and engaged and, you know, going to throw this one out there. Cause I'm absolutely surprised that people say they know, but what they do is very different and having lifeguards on their cell phones in the lifeguard office, like is just a huge no, no. And we always say that, well, it's them, but they're just not engaged and mm -hmm. it's your responsibility. It's the number one thing that we get questioned when an incident happens is were they distracted. Right. And, but that's where I think it also comes back to us as in those management positions and leaders. I actually also think we weren't taught on how to have those difficult conversations. So often I find, you know, the management and the leadership thinks that they're going to ruin their their friendships with them if they tell them they can't do something right so how do we approach it you have to make it across the board no favoritism this is what it is here's the reason why right so and um being able to just get back to making lifeguarding important, making them feel proud of what they do. They're not proud. They come to work, they earn a paycheck, they go home, right? So versus actually being excited to be there, making your in-services challenging and exciting, setting some standards. People like standards. They like goals. They like crushing like their times and like giving them those opportunities to be proud, right? So we're just missing a huge part of that leadership. Well, and I think there's so much you could unpack from what you've said, but one thing that really struck me is recently I taught a national lifeguard course and towards the end of the course, I think it was only day four, um, a candidate disclosed to us in kind of the feedback session that they had actually taken an NL a few months ago and failed. And I would not have thought that at all based on this person's performance, but they were sharing with us that they really appreciated how we structured the course in terms of knowing what was going to happen each day. So just a general outline of we're going to be in the pool in the morning, we're going to do these topics, then we'll be in the classroom in the afternoon. And he was reflecting on the course that he took at the facility elsewhere. And he said, it just felt so disorganized. Yes, I'm responsible for not passing, but I also didn't have a sense of what we were trying to learn or accomplish. And it made me realize so many times I've been, let's say, with other instructors the night before a course, and they'll say something like, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sort of prepared for tomorrow. It's a National Lifeguard course. I've done it a million times. I'm not really worried about it. And they stop taking it as seriously versus, let's say, uh, a management meeting or something with advanced instructors where people would be really prepared. And it really got me to thinking that, you know, you're assuming that that 16 or 17 year old isn't going to know notice your lack of organization. And they are very astute now. I mean, I at 16 may not have noticed your lack of disorganization, but these quote unquote kids are so on the ball 
And he really experienced that in his course. And that really caused us to think, have we been giving enough structure? Have we been giving enough guardrails? Have we been giving enough, you know, checkpoints and setting that standard? Because I think you're exactly right. People want to succeed if they know what's expected, if they don't know what's expected or what to anticipate at work, then you do have to rely kind of on the stick method if they know what's going on, they are more likely to be personally incentivized, kind of the carrot method to do it themselves, I think. And Katie, like I know you as an instructor and you're a beautiful teacher. And I think, you know, I think when it comes back to those standards, um, you know, same for myself, like I'm in the water with them teaching. And the amount of instructors that I see currently that are teaching from the edge, not getting in the water, not doing them. Like as long as you have somebody who's not successful and your first, my first three days are in the water fully. And, you know, as long long as I have somebody who's not being successful, you still need to hit all of those learning styles, right? It's, you still need to be, okay, maybe I didn't demonstrate it how they needed to. Maybe I didn't physically manipulate. Maybe I didn't, right? You need to keep asking what you didn't do to try and get them there and utilizing all of that time. So, um, and that, that could be like a huge difference between even how they feel coming out of a course, right? So as you said, like just what he experienced in one course versus another, when we're all actually supposed to be fairly streamlined and we're delivering the same program. So why are we so different? Um, we need to start having some expectations amongst us as, you know, instructors and trainers who are out there because Um, I'm sure you've had it more often than not. And me too, where, you know, I get kids that come into NLs and they don't know how to do a spinal rollover or they're like, I wasn't taught that. And, and, you know, before it used to be like, okay, lots of them would say, well, I wasn't taught that or every so often you get that. Um, But it is more often than not now that it's like, we're not actually, there's a difference between teaching them to just say you taught it and teaching them so that they know it. And that's why when there is, you know, 16 hours in a standard first aid, or when there's 40 hours in an NL use, they paid for the time, like give them all of the time. Even if you're like, Oh, that's good enough. Make them better. Like make them more confident, make them, you know, like be proud and excited for your candidates to give them every opportunity to be successful. They paid for your time, give that time to them. That's, and that's such a huge piece too, because there's, so many times what to your point where, well, they want to get out early or let's let them go early and a little bit of, you know, 10 minutes before five o'clock is fine or giving people a choice of we're going to do this extra activity. If your ride is waiting for you, you're welcome to go. But if you have the time to stay, we're going to do this value added exercise or this beyond the standard thing you might be curious to know. But so many people are so, you know, the standard is the standard and that's important But to your point of they're going out and looking for jobs or they want to be deck ready, a lot of kids, at least in that class I'm thinking of, were really hungry to learn more. And so it would have been shortchanging them to say, oh, yeah, I'm done in 10 minutes. So I'm just going to tap out now so I can clean up my space and get out the door on time. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, our program delivery is huge and not just ending in those original courses. It comes back to our, our research too. Our research should be just as effective as our regular courses. We should always be growing and learning and not cutting those corners. And, you know, it may be the next um, scenario that you do that they learn something from, but if we're not doing them, right? So, um, or even in standard first aid, I know they increased the time a while ago. The research used to be four hours and now they're eight and I'm watching that get shortchanged all the time. And I'm like, but it is a lot of information in a short amount of time. And so often in those research, I hear lots, it's like, oh, I don't remember doing that. And it's a three-year certification, right? So they lose a lot of that information. I've been teaching standard for state for 15 years and I'm excited. I'm glad that we have an eight hour research because it's a lot of information to get through and to sign off that they were confident and competent in it when majority of them are leaving to go to a workspace where it actually states in there that the standard of care is that, you know, in a workspace, they're not covered under the Good Samaritans Act. They're not covered under, they're expected to respond to the level of training that they have, which is what you're delivering. So if they leave without that knowledge, expect them to be able to deliver to what you gave them. So any final thoughts, Raylene, you want to add, or, I mean, we'll just have to do this again. 
Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I love our space. I love aquatics. I think there's always room for, for growth and stuff. I think, um, you know, a good reflection for us is to stop making excuses and start um, actually conquering the problems and and being honest with ourselves. Um, having that self reflection is huge. It doesn't mean that you know you're failing or anything. We just we we can do better. And you know, I think I don't think that there's anyone in our space, especially like of the. I hate saying this because man, I'm like you're there, but of the old <laughs> generation. <laughs> um, that hasn't talked about what aquatics used to be, um, and reflected on like those, those times in it. Um, you know, let's give that to who we have today and how do we get back to that? I, we used to talk about how, you know, great our lifeguards were in the training and all of these things. And, and, you know, we're robbing our current, um, lifeguards of that opportunity to explore and feel the same thing. So how do we do that? And that it actually does start with us. So and so many old things I think about I used to teach in the water for seven hours with no bio break. And I was happy for the shift, thought I was making good money. But when I think about that now, there's just so much wrong with that. And it it, it just didn't work for me, didn't work for the kids, didn't work for the organization. But that's how we did it. And that's definitely not something we should still be doing, nor is it something that most pools, at least in Alberta, are still doing because we know better now. So there's we can't get <laughs> too rosy about the past, right? All right. Well, thanks so much, Raylene, for being here. Yeah. And thanks so much for chatting about this. And we'll chat again soon. Sounds good. Thanks, Katie.